Chris, are you are you ready? I'm just just about ready to go here, Alan. Good morning, to you on this Saturday. Oh, good morning. It's nice to nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see both of you guys. Chris, do I have an IRA? I sure hope so. You're getting up there in the years. Yeah. Hey, this stuff really makes my head spin. Yeah, especially I've seen how you drink. You got a wooden leg. Oh, that's a good one. Well, thanks for joining us today. And I, I hope that you do a better job than Alan does, because he really just bores everyone to tears. Well, I have my box of tissues here just in case. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That wasn't so funny though. All right. I'll see you guys later. Good luck. I hope I hope it's it's better than last week. Last week was really not very good. Hi. All right. Here we are, 11 a.m. Saturday, September 10th. I'm here with the dummy and also Christopher Di Nicolo. And we're going to talk about the SECURE Act and proposed regulations. Before we get started, if you entered through CPA Academy, you can answer the polling questions when they come up and you'll get credit. If you entered through our normal website, you don't have to worry about the polling questions. You can just take a break during the polling questions and uh, you will not receive continuing education credit. In about two or three hours, you'll be getting an email from us. It'll be the 97th email you got from us this week, and it will give you an, an ability to click to, to uh, play the webinar or to get the PowerPoint slides. You can forward that to all your friends, neighbors, relatives, and enemies. It's a very nice gift. If you have questions during the presentation, and a lot of you have already asked questions, you can just click on the inverted pyramid there. I don't know why it's an inverted pyramid, but that's what it is. And then you can type in your answer. And towards the end of the presentation, Chris and I will pretend to answer some of your questions. At approximately noon or a little bit after noon, I'm going to interview a new friend, uh, Jackson Schimbecker, and we'll do this live for those of you who want to stick around. Jackson is a 19-year-old prodigy. He is, uh, has been very successful financially. He is also a college baseball player and plays the piano and the violin and his mother loves him so i'm speaking next week at a high school on getting ready for your professional career and jackson's going to give me some pointers so stick around at noon that will not be for cpe credit but it should hopefully be i think it'll be very very interesting or at least it'll be interesting to me next week we're going to talk about trust arrangements for children what planners and their clients need to know it's going to be a very practically based presentation. I hope you'll join us. And then the following Saturday, Brandon and I are going to talk about planning with charitable remainder trusts. So without much further ado and to do, Chris, I'm going to hand this over to you. But first, I just want to mention, we have a new spreadsheet system. If anyone is interested in getting the spreadsheet, just let us know. And what we're doing now is when we get a client and they tell us what is in their IRA and what their age is, we just say, well, you know, if that IRA grows at 3% a year and you have to start taking your minimum distributions at age 72, then based on the present minimum distribution rules, here's how much you're going to receive each year until the IRA runs out. And by the way, it doesn't run out at age 100. It keeps going. So uh, we're gonna start putting these on the client charts so that they can get a sense of uh, where they are from a retirement standpoint. And we're glad to share that uh, spreadsheet with you. Just email us or let us know on the questions box. Please send me the spreadsheet. Chris, with 57 minutes remaining, take it away. Thanks very much, Alan. If we could just go back here to slide 17, kick us off, just kind of give us a, a little summary of what this this groundbreaking SECURE Act has done since 2019, December of 2019, when it was released, and of course the proposed regulations that we got in February of this year. And if you would ask me in 
the summer of 2019 whether there would be substantial changes to the IRA law, I would have laughed at you. But alas, here we are, <laughs> where things are quite a bit different. And one of the biggest differences that was resulting from the SECURE Act is now the required beginning date, that's the date at which you have to begin taking required minimum distributions, will now be age 72 rather than age 70 and a half. That's a pro taxpayer change because what that does is essentially allows another 18 months of deferral, potentially two years of deferral on when, a, uh, when someone has to start taking these distributions from their IRA, which in most cases are going to be subject to ordinary income tax. However, the downside to the SECURE Act is the life expectancy rule that we all have known to grow and uh, known and, and to, to love over the years in, in stretching out IRA distributions after death has been substantially reduced in its efficacy. Uh, in fact, there's only five kinds of beneficiaries that are entitled to use this life expectancy rule, and they are listed here. The surviving spouse of an IRA owner or retirement plan participant, a minor child of the participant, not any minor child, just the participant's minor child, a disabled beneficiary or a chronically ill beneficiary, and lastly, a beneficiary who is no more than 10 years younger than the participant. So if you're outside of that class of five, then you're stuck with the dreaded 10-year rule as the best case scenario. And we'll get into the 10-year rule and what it means and how it works in just a minute. When it came out, the SECURE Act had this idea of you know, uh, an accumulation trust, which is a trust that allows the trustee to accumulate distributions from an IRA or retirement plan for beneficiaries. That accumulation trust would not work for the stretch, even if it was for one of these five special eligible designated beneficiaries. The only exception was the disabled or chronically ill beneficiary could have an accumulation trust for their benefit. Fortunately, the proposed regulations have broadened this a little bit, and we'll get into that nuance uh, here in just a minute, but that's one benefit that results from our 2022 proposed regulations. So Alan, this 10-year rule that came out when the SECURE Act was released, we all thought, okay, well, I die, I leave my, uh, my, my, my IRA benefits in an accumulation trust for my good friend, Alan. He is not one of the, the five beneficiaries, and even so, it's an accumulation trust, so it doesn't matter. So Alan can just wait until December 31 of the 10th year following my death to pull out all the IRA benefits, and he can have that 10 years of deferral. However, if I'm past my required beginning date when I die, if I die at age 73, for example, the proposed regulations say that Alan now has to take a distribution every year as if it was under the old secure, the old pre-secure act regime. And then finally, in the 10th year, he has to take out all retirement plan benefits from the IRA. And that's a sweeping change and quite a big difference from what we expected uh, under, under the SECURE Act. The proposed regulations, of course, haven't been finalized, but you know, there, this is a big component uh, that a lot of commentators are, are looking at and saying, is this shouldn't be. So hopefully the final regulations won't have that you know, inside track every year distribution if someone dies after their required beginning date. Finally, the big change here is that the SECURE Act applies only for individuals who died on or after January 1, 2022. Now, if I die in 2019 and leave an accumulation trust for my good friend Alan, he can take benefits out over his life expectancy. However, if he is the oldest beneficiary of that trust and he dies after the SECURE Act, then the SECURE Act kicks in on his death. So if he dies in 2022, then the 10-year rule would apply after his death and his designated beneficiaries or the beneficiaries of that trust would not be entitled to use his life expectancy. So Chris, I think you accidentally said January 1, 2022. I think you meant people who die after January 1, 2020. That's right. Under Act. Yes, that, that's correct. January 1, 2020 is, is the effective date of the SECURE Act. So then if a client dies after their required beginning date, which is now pretty much age 72, we're, are we advising them? We're advising their beneficiaries to continue to take those minimum distributions until we get the new regulations. We're not going to take the risk that those proposed regulations are, are going to be changed, right? I think so. I mean, the proposed regulations do not necessarily constitute law, right? But you know, if, if, the, if the amounts are small and if the beneficiary potentially has a need for funds, then, you know, it's 
better best practice to, to comply with the proposed regs in that regard. Right, but wait till the very end of the year in case they get fixed before the, is there any chance we're gonna get these new regulations this year? You know, Brandon Ketron and I are speaking at the Notre Dame Tax and State Planning Institute on this very topic on November 9. And when we set our title, we put in there possibly final regulations, hoping that they'll be released. Of course, that said, they'll be released on November 5th, right? <laughs> right before our talk. But, you know, Is who that- knows? Uh, who knows that there was a an open forum for commentary and if you go on there you can see everyone from respected ira commentators such as mike jones out in monterey california to you know joe smith behind a computer somewhere were sending in comments and a lot of the comments were just tearing down this whole concept of the 10-year rule being incorrect as it's applied under the proposed regs so yeah. We'll and, and the, yeah, the theme here is Congress gave you a beautiful tax deduction to fund these IRAs and these pension plans, and now they want you to pay tax and pull it out a little bit sooner than you would have. So, right. you know, we're still fortunate to get all the tax deductions when we put these in, get the deferral. Now, does this apply to Roth IRAs as well, as far as how fast you, even though they're not taxable, you got to pull it out fast and eventually invest them in taxable vehicles? Yeah, it does. It curtails the, the tax deferral, but as you said, the, the Roth distributions are not subject to the tax. And then just to make it clear for, because we have a lot of laymen on the talk, uh, if your IRA pours out to a person, it has to come out within 10 years, unless the person is one of these five right, categories of people. If your IRA is payable to a trust, it may still come out over the lifetime of one of these people if the trust is properly drafted. Um, or it may come out in 10 years if the trust is properly drafted or five years if the trust is not properly drafted. So, you know, one of the questions we often get from from investment advisors is, is this a stretch trust? Will it allow a five, a 10 year stretch? Because a lot of people draft these trusts and don't put the magic language in and then they only get the five year stretch. That's right. And and Alan, I guess a key point that we kind of glossed over is this idea that you can't have a non-individual beneficiary of an IRA and get the benefit of even the 10-year rule. Uh, in that event, the law generally says all benefits have to come out within five years. Five years, excuse me. And the way that that, that five-year rule has been interpreted is no matter how, what, what your age is when you die, if I leave my IRA to uh, you know, a corporation for some reason, then that corporation has to take out all benefits by December 31 of the fifth year after my death. Doesn't mean that they have to take distributions every year, one through four, uh, but it's just that fifth year it pours out. And that's generally looked at as the worst case scenario with regard to IRA planning. Okay, so if you're not sure whether you have to take out every year for the first 10, you could take out nothing and then take out everything at the end of year five if the, if the statute doesn't come out where you where you want it, that's one alternative. Um, I also just wanted to make it clear here that you could make your IRA payable to a charity. So your IRA could be payable to your family foundation, and then you have to take it out within the five years, but you know, your family foundation doesn't have to pay any tax on an IRA. So if your client or you are charitable at all, just make the IRA payable, say to your spouse, alternate beneficiary, maybe one third to charity, one third to each of your children. And the part that goes to charity is never subject to income tax. So that can be a good thing. The other thing I wanna mention, just because it's so important, is that the new proposed regulations basically say that you can change things all around as long as you change them around in your trust by September 30 of the year following death. So we have a trust protector provision in our documents which say that if for any reason a trust established under this trust agreement would receive an IRA and that IRA would not qualify for minimum distribution stretch, then the trust protector can amend the IRA so that it will qualify for a distribution stretch. So if you see nothing else and think of nothing else during this presentation, at least try to think about seeing and thinking about that. And now I wanna go and get the first polling question done. And the first polling question, those of you who are with CPA Academy, 
would you like to be added to our Thursday report, which is free and comes out on Thursday sometimes? <laughs> A, yes. B, I'm already prescribed, I mean subscribed. Or C, I would rather have a spinal tap. So we just need your answer there, A, B, or C, before we can go on to the next part of this more than thrilling presentation. Brittany, how are we doing? All right, polling question completed. So Chris, now I'm really gonna get out of your way, <laughs> as I promised. What page would you like to be on? That's, this is perfect right here. So much of what, what we've talked about already is, is set forth on the next few slides here. Um, but before I get into that, there's a question that's kind of important uh, from a big picture standpoint. The question is, what happens if the assets are not distributed in 10 years? And that really, the, the main question is, what happens if you don't make a, a distribution when it's required? It's a 50% excise tax if you do not make a required minimum distribution. That is draconian and har very harsh. So, you know, it's one of those things where err on the side of making the distribution um, and make sure you're aware of these deadlines because this is a very big trap for the unweary and clients can fall into it if they're not properly advised that they have to make a distribution. Uh, so that that is one key thing to keep in mind as we talk about these required minimum distributions. So Alan, here on slide 19, you know, we talked about the 10-year rule. And when, this, when the SECURE Act came out, we thought, well, the 10-year rule means you can just wait until December 31 of the 10th year following the participant's death and then pull the assets out. But as I said, if someone dies after their required beginning date, which is generally age 72, there's two tracks. So back to my example, I leave the, the assets in a trust for Alan, an accumulation trust. He's the oldest beneficiary. He has to take distributions every year using his life expectancy under this annual distributions track. He also has to take all assets remaining in the IRA out of the IRA, and it can just go into the trust by December 31 of the 10th year following my death. Uh, so that's a big difference from what we've seen, uh, what we thought to be the case when the actual statute was released. We'll see what happens with the final regulations, as we mentioned. On the next slide, we talk a little bit about what, uh, you know, the, these certain types of trust that can be disregarded. So as a general matter, there's two types of favorable trusts that can receive IRA benefits. One is the accumulation trust that I mentioned, and that is just like it sounds. The trustee can accumulate distributions from the IRA, hold them in a trust. So if, the, if Alan is the beneficiary of an accumulation trust, his trustee can accumulate IRA distributions. It doesn't necessarily have to pay them out to him. It could, health education maintenance and support, or for any other reason, but there's no requirement under the IRA law that the distributions go out to him. The other type of trust is a conduit trust, also a very well-named trust, because the way that a conduit trust works is any distributions from the IRA must flow through the trust as a conduit and come and be paid out to Alan in that example. Now, if we use a conduit trust for Alan, who happens to be no more than 10 years younger than me, then he can use his life expectancy because he's an eligible designated beneficiary. So that conduit trust arrangement has benefits or as opposed to an accumulation trust. However, what that means is that distributions can be paid out to him automatically, right? So any creditor concerns you might have or asset concerns you might have would be essentially uh, avoided or you, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the benefit of a trust structure in that regard. Now with a conduit trust, remainder beneficiaries are disregarded. OK, and what that means is that if Alan dies under a conduit trust arrangement, we can say that the benefits go to his estate or my estate or a corporation, for example. Those beneficiaries are completely disregarded. Uh, more, more, I guess more practically, a, a charity might be a remainder beneficiary. When we talk about required minimum distribution payouts, when a conduit trust, we look only at the conduit beneficiary. In an accumulation trust, we look at generally 
two types of beneficiaries that we'll talk about, but just put very plainly, it's beneficiaries that can receive IRA benefits uh, during Alan's lifetime in our example, or after his death. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. But a conduit trust, you just look at the conduit beneficiary. The other type of, of change here is this power of appointment and trust protector action change. This was a big pro-taxpayer change in the proposed regulations. Under the prior law, it was thought that if someone had a power of appointment, and that's a fancy way of saying if someone has the power to control where assets go, uh, any possible appointee, any possible person or entity that could receive assets on exercise of that power of appointment would be taken into account for required minimum distribution determination purposes. However, the new law says that unless the power of appointment is exercised or irrevocably released or modified, uh, we do not look at the potential class of appointees. Instead, we look at the takers in default. And those are the people who would inherit if the power of appointment is not exercised. So in other words, we can have Allen in an accumulation trust have the power to appoint IRA assets to charity upon his death. Uh, and if he doesn't exercise that irrevocably or release it irrevocably, then we don't look at the charities for the purposes of determining whether the charity is a beneficiary of the trust. Alan, do you have anything to add? No, no, you're doing a great job. I know I recognize this stuff is comp complicated and very technical, so I'm trying to keep it simple. Um, you know, and, and if anyone has any questions, we'll try to get to it. You can always email Alan or I with any questions outside of the presentation. And then Alan mentioned earlier this idea of trust protector actions, you know, similar trust modification techniques like reformations and decanting. Uh, can be employed if they're completed before September 30 of the calendar year following the death of the IRA participant or owner. And that September 30 day is called either the designation date or determination date, but it's a magic deadline because that's the date when the IRS will look at the IRA arrangement or trust arrangement, excuse me, and determine who the beneficiaries are for required minimum distribution payout purposes. Here's an example. I have my IRA, I leave it to an accumulation trust for Allen. The trust also says that the trustee can make distributions at any time for the benefit of one or more Section 501c3 charitable organizations. Well, the fact that those charities could receive IRA benefits disqualifies the trust as a stretched trust, meaning that we are stuck in five-year rule land and we don't get the benefit of the 10-year rule. However, trust protectors under the trust could eliminate or pay out the charity uh, before that September 30 date, and they will not be considered for required minimum distribution purposes. So th this is a very important and helpful tool that the proposed regulations have, have promulgated. We hopefully uh, will see this in the final. I, don't, I have no reason to believe that it would be eliminated. So uh, you know, it certainly helps a lot of individuals or, or a lot of trust drafting that might not have been the best when it was done. Alan, we're going to move to the next slide here. The proposed regulations also gave us definitions for disabled and chronically ill. Now, it's important to note that a disabled or chronically ill beneficiary uh, will be determined as to whether they fit in those classes as of the date of death of the plan participant. Here's an example. I leave assets in an accumulation trust for the benefit of my adult child. That child is not disabled or chronically ill at the time of my death, but unfortunately, a week later, something happens that makes him disabled or chronically ill. Well, he is not disabled or chronically ill for required minimum distribution payout purposes. So that is important to note. Um, the proposed regulations in the SECURE Act didn't necessarily change a whole lot with respect to spousal rollovers. So if I leave my IRA to my wife, she can roll that IRA into her own IRA, or she can elect to treat uh, all or some of it as a beneficiary, which is very helpful because then she has choices after my death as to whether she wants a deferral, i.e. she wants to roll it over into her own and defer distributions until she's age 72 and take at a more favorable distribution rate, 
or if she is under the age of 59 and a half, she can have a portion of my IRA available to her as a beneficiary. And that's important because remember, if you have your own IRA and you pull assets out before you reach the age 59 and a half, then generally you're going to be subject to a 10% penalty excise tax unless you meet one of the exceptions. Um, when we have young spouses who unfortunately are, are left as, as widowers, uh, we typically tell them, look, here are your choices. And we run the numbers very similar to what we showed you on, uh, on, the, on the spreadsheet earlier. Uh, and the beauty of a rollover is that it's not an all or nothing thing. The surviving spouse can say, I'm going to roll over 20% of the IRA and keep 80 because I think I'm going to need these funds. Or she can say, yeah, I'm not going to need these funds at all. I'm going to roll over the entire IRA. What's more, there's no deadline for a rollover. The rollover could, could occur five years down the road, 10 years down the road. Um, the, the law is very favorable when it comes to spousal beneficiaries under an IRA. I will say, however, the accumulation trust for the benefit of a surviving spouse, uh, you know, it, it, unless it fits into an exception, you're going to have the 10-year the payout. Most accumulation trusts that are drafted provide for the surviving spouse and other non-eligible designated beneficiaries. And in that case, you're going to be stuck with the 10-year rule. Now, Alan, this teapot trust system we came up with in 2020, uh, that is something that I think has a lot of utility here for many clients. And, and the way that it works is as follows. If you have an, uh, three children, one child is a high earner, and maybe another child is on the other end, other end of the spectrum as in a very low tax bracket, uh, you, you don't necessarily want IRA assets being held for the benefit of the high earner because they're, they're subject to higher tax rates uh, and the family is going to be hit with more tax. Well, the idea that we came up with is you form this teapot trust, which is like a 10-year accumulation trust that's subject to the 10-year rule. You leave IRA benefits to the uh, teapot trust, and then you leave other assets to something known as an equalization trust. And the teapot trust trustee can make distributions of IRA assets to the lower tax bracket beneficiary, whereas the equalization trust that has assets that are not IRAs or retirement plans, can make distributions to the higher earner. And by structuring it in this manner, the higher earner gets assets that are not necessarily subject to income tax, and the lower earner gets assets, IRA assets that are subject to income tax. And the whole idea behind this is that you can use the equalization trust to balance out what each beneficiary will receive uh, from the trust, but do so in a manner that lowers the overall tax bill. Uh, so really, it, it's, a, it's a great idea for a lot of clients who don't necessarily uh, have their estates comprised solely of IRA assets and want to benefit their children in a manner that's going to reduce the tax burden accordingly. Finally, the charitable remainder trust, and we'll get into this in a little more down the road. As Alan mentioned, if you leave assets, IRA assets to a, a charity or to a trust that benefits a charity, such as a charitable remainder trust, um, you're going to be subject to the five-year rule. However, the charitable remainder trust does not pay tax. So when the assets come out of the IRA, there's no tax to the trust. When the charitable remainder trust makes distributions to, indivi to uh, individuals up front, those distributions carry out ordinary income tax. And the charitable remainder trust could be structured so that it can pay out over an individual's life expectancy. So this is an artificial way to get the stretch that was available under the prior law uh, while using a charity to receive the, the assets that remain in the trust after a term of years or after a beneficiary's lifetime. So a very viable tool as well. So, so Chris, let me, let me break in here. I think this is really, really good. I want to mention when when a spouse dies, please don't rush into the broker's office and change all the IRAs to roll over IRAs or make any other decisions like that before you've spoken to your tax advisors. 
because the surviving spouse may be better off leaving that IRA as an inherited IRA, at least for a period of time, especially if the plan uh, participant was younger than the surviving spouse, if you could use the plan participant's uh, life expectancy, or if the surviving spouse has not reached 59 and a half and wants to be able to take distributions without paying an excise tax. So it, it, it's kind of painful when the client comes to us and says, well, my spouse died and I've already squared away retitling all the accounts. So, you know, you can't unring the bell and it's too late to disclaim anything joint. So, you know, call us first. We're kind of like the Maytag repairman in that area. Uh, so I think that's just important to note. The other thing that's important to note is just tell your clients, if you don't want to pay it within 10 years, consider a charitable remainder unit trust where charity gets about 10% 20 years later, and you can, you can delay your distributions. So I want to go ahead and do the second uh, polling question here which is on page 35. And the question is, the proposed regulations provide that the 10-year rule requires the annual minimum distribution to be made each year after the participant's death, if the participant died after the required beginning date. So in other words, according to the proposed regulations, you have to take a payment in every year not just wait until the 10th year. You have to take the minimum required distributions. The answer here is true, so you can mark an A, and then the incorrect answer would be false, which is B. And if you already answered B, then you'll be excluded from, from the uh, remainder of this program. No, I'm just kidding. You'll still get full credit because you tried and because we care. Okay. Everybody has answered. The vast majority of you said A, which was the correct answer. Chris, what page are we on now? Well, before we get to, we could stop here for a second. There's a couple of questions I want to address. The first is this 50% rule that I mentioned, and perhaps I didn't do a good job explaining it. Sorry, 50% tax. If you don't make a requirement minimum distribution, the tax is 50% of what should have come out. For example, if there's a $100,000 required minimum distribution. It's not taken timely. That tax is $50,000. That's significant. So it, it's something to, to you know, really be aware of these deadlines. It's, it's very important. Another question, uh, generally procedural here, is is there a handout that explains all of this? Well, I believe you all have a copy of the PowerPoint deck here, which is pretty, does a pretty good job explaining this we're going to get into a couple of charts here in fact this is about as good a time as any to go here i'm not going to run through the chart because frankly what we've discussed already is covered by much of this but this chart beginning on page 23 and going through the following pages uh shows what the pre-secure act law was and what the, the post-secure act law is and it it covers things such as the required beginning date uh the stretch and now our new 10-year rule that's that's available. Eligible designated beneficiaries, uh, new concepts here. And, and of course, the, as we keep going, the 10-year rule that we talked about, there was a question about this, so I'll, I'll, I'll go over it one more time. So if somebody dies after the age of 72 and leaves assets, in a, IRA assets, in a manner that would be subject to the 10-year rule, what that means is that the beneficiary has to take distributions every year in years one through nine. So take a distribution by December 31 of years one through nine in each year based upon the IRA tables as issued by the IRS, similar to what applied in the Pre-Secure Act law. Additionally, by December 31 of the 10th year after the owner's death, all of the assets have to come out. It's the part between years one through nine that we were completely sideswiped when, when, in the, uh, when the proposed regs came out. Uh, so that's why we call it the new and unimproved 10-year rule. <laughs> Hopefully we will, this unimproved 10-year rule will not be in the final regulations. So we talked earlier about accumulation trusts. You know, these proposed regulations 
actually define the term uh, accumulation trust uh, and actually do a great job of just revamping the entire system for determining who the beneficiaries are for required minimum distribution purposes. Uh, now, in order for a trust to be something known as a see-through trust, and just to think of it this way, a see-through trust, think of it as a circle. In that circle are conduit trusts and accumulation trusts. So conduit trust is one type of see-through trust, and accumulation trust is another type of see-through trust. A conduit trust and an accumulation trust both are see-through trusts. To meet the requirements for a see-through trust, you have to meet these, these five or these four uh, criteria here. The trust has to be revocable, it has to be valid under state law, all beneficiaries have to be identifiable, which means that you, you have to identify who is eligible to receive a portion of the IRA assets. And that can be a class of individuals. So it, it's it's not necessarily listing the beneficiaries by names. And then an often overlooked requirement is this thing where you have to give the plan administrator a copy of the trust or information regarding the trust. It's better just to give them a copy by Halloween of the calendar year following the participant's death. So our chronology is participant dies by September 30 of the next year. That's the day on which the beneficiaries are determined for required minimum distribution purposes. And then a month later, on October 31, a copy of the trust or certain information has to be given to the plan administrator. So get, get in the habit of, of understanding those distributions or those, those deadlines uh, as, as, you, as we work on administering IRAs. So we already talked about conduit trust and an accumulation trust. Uh, Alan, do we want to get into the next polling question, or is that premature? Um, uh, let me see. We already got this one. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. All right. So we talked about conduit trusts and accumulation trusts. Uh, you know, beneficiaries of trusts that are disregarded. And this is important. I talked earlier about this magic September 30 designation date that occurs. Well, if a beneficiary receives all their benefits from a trust prior to that September 30 day, they are not taken into account for required minimum distribution purposes. Also, if they die before that September 30 day, they are not considered to be uh, taken into account for required minimum distribution purposes. If you have a power of appointment, again, a fancy way of saying somebody can determine who else gets property. Uh, Back to our example, I leave a trust for Allen, an accumulation trust. He has a power of appointment. He, before September 30 of the year after my death, appoints those assets to his daughter, Nicole. Well, he can he does that. She is taken into account as a beneficiary. Other possible appointees are not taken into account. So if he could have appointed it to Nicole or one or more charities that he decides, the charities are not taken into account for required minimum distribution purposes. So that, that's, a, that's a neat wrinkle that came out from the proposed regs. There's a few examples of beneficiaries who will be uh, disregarded even after that September 30 day. And one of them is this concept of a tier three beneficiary. So a, a, a tier one beneficiary is somebody who can receive IRA benefits from an accumulation trust after the plan participant's death. In my example I've been using, I leave it to Alan. He's the only beneficiary who can receive distributions from the accumulation trust during his lifetime. He is a tier one beneficiary. The trust also says on Alan's death, the IRA assets go to his daughter, Nicole. Nicole is a tier two beneficiary because she can only receive benefits after Alan's death. Let's say the trust says after both Alan dies and Nicole dies, the assets go to the Florida Holocaust Museum, for example, okay? Allen is a tier one beneficiary. Nicole is a tier two beneficiary. The Florida Holocaust Museum is not considered to be a beneficiary of the trust. They're what's known as a tier three beneficiary. So for required minimum distribution purposes, there is no charity as a beneficiary, and we disregard their interest in an accumulation trust. This is way easier than the way it was prior to the SECURE Act. 
You know, it took a little time to understand it and to follow your way around the maze that was the proposed regulations. But now that we've we've done so, it makes counting beneficiaries a lot easier uh, and allows for charities to be named as remainder beneficiaries without uh, uh, with, without having adverse income tax consequences. Slide 39 just restates everything I just said about tiers one, two, and three beneficiaries. Uh, so it's, it's a good resource for you to consult in the future. All right, another type of, of beneficiary that needs to be, and oh, I'm sorry, by the way, there's a chart here that, that goes over what we just talked about with tier one beneficiaries, tier two, tier three, and possible appointees of powers of appointment. Another beneficiary that can that's disregarded, and bear with me here, this can be a little complicated, but it is in the proposed regulations, is a beneficiary who can inherit only by surviving a minor if the trust says when the minor hits age 31, all assets have to come out. Here's the example. I leave IRA assets in accumulation trust for my six-year-old son, Luke. Okay, Luke is the sole beneficiary uh, of the of the trust, um, and when when the trust reaches age 31, or sorry, when he reaches age 31, he receives all distributions out from the trust. Uh, but if Luke unfortunately dies before age 31, the trust says Alan gets the the benefits from the, from the trust. Alan is disregarded as a beneficiary because his only interest comes into effect if he survives Luke. Right, even though Alan's a tier two beneficiary based upon what we just talked about. This special minor exception allows uh, you know, for some flexibility in planning when you have a minor child as a primary beneficiary of an accumulation trust. Alan, do you have anything to add? I would never release a, a lot of money to a 31 year old. That's 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 an so, important practical point. Absolutely. I, so we, I was I was surprised when Natalie gave that the best proposed regulation of the year award. You know, we were at the ceremony when she did this, and <laughs> you know, I thought it was going to be the clawback rules, but there, there yeah. it was. She she gave this regulation the award, and I, yeah, I don't know many thirty-one year olds that I would give any assets to, let alone sixty-one year olds or ninety-one year olds, which we'll be discussing next week. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's there, just so you know, it's there. Um, and then, of course, we've talked earlier, remainder beneficiaries of a conduit trust, conduit trust for my friend Alan. When he dies, the Florida Holocaust Museum receives the benefits. Well, the, the Holocaust Museum is not a beneficiary in a conduit trust for required minimum distribution purposes. We use Alan's life expectancy, given that he's an eligible designated beneficiary relative to me. All right, so there's a, yet another beneficiary or minor minor child exception. And just let me clarify this. The prior example that I mentioned, where a minor child receives a distribution on age 31 uh, of all assets, that applies to any minor, not just my child, any minor. I use my son, Luke. I could have used my nephew, my 11-year-old nephew, Matthew. And in same thing, okay? This exemption applies only to a child. So this is kind of a, a, a funky one. If I leave my IRA to an accumulation trust for Alan, who's an eligible designated beneficiary, and my six-year-old son, Luke, well then uh, the, the trust is considered to be comprised of eligible designated beneficiaries um, until age 31. So when, when my when my son hits 21, it's no longer that, and the 10-year rule kicks in. Uh, again, this can be useful if you have a minor child uh, of the trust, you know, of an accumulation trust, to take advantage of a 10-year stretch um, if you have other eligible designated beneficiaries as beneficiaries of the trust as well. So in other words, if I'm going to leave it to my brother, but I want it to stretch longer, I could put in my brother and my grandniece. And even though my grandniece doesn't really receive anything, she's listed as a discretionary beneficiary, that's gonna allow that trust to stretch longer. That's right. That's right. Now, you know, it, it, it certainly 
don't let the tax tail wag the dog here is one of the big pointers. You know, if you don't want your grand needs to be a beneficiary, then obviously, you know, the, the client should be made aware of that. This might provide some tax benefits, but, you know, think of it this way, an undesired beneficiary, uh, if assets go to that beneficiary, it's 100% tax. So, you know, keep that in, in mind. Okay, so here's our next polling. Here's our Latin, or here's our second to last polling question. In the future, would you like to hear about charitable solutions for wealthy clients, creditor protection, basic estate planning checklist, or what I did during my summer vacation? So there's no correct answer here. We're just interested in what your answer is. A, charitable solutions, B, creditor protection, C, basic estate planning, and D, what I did during my summer vacation. I'm in Florida. I sweated during my summer vacation. <laughs> Same here. Still sweating here. Yeah. Even the, even the alligators had to jump in the water. It was so hot. <laughs> okay, where do we go next, Chris? We have 15 minutes. You go to the also, next phase here. Yep. Yep, so proposed regs also gave us a little more clarity on definitions. A minor child, you know, previously there was a thought that maybe you can stretch the word minor to mean up until age 26 if there is a specified course of education involved. Well, the proposed regs make it nice and easy. 21 years old is the is the definition of minor. That's why we kept saying with reference, you know, age 31. That's why we just said 31 and not 28 for the 10-year rule. Disabled. So here's the definition for disabled. Um, you know, there, the Social Security definition. Uh, it is determined, is used in part here. I, I saw a question that said, someone said, God help us if they use the social security definition of disabled. Unfortunately, that's the case. Um, but the definition is different depending on whether the person is under 18 or over 18. And, and you see that here. Chronically ill is determined with reference to uh, Internal Revenue Code section 7702 cap B. And, and you'll see that here. In fact, I think on the next slide, Alan, we go into a little more nitty gritty of, of what chronically ill means. I'm not going to dive into these nuances, but I do want to let you all know that this is here and a, where to look for it if this situation should come up in your practice. And it has to be chronically ill on the date of death, not became chronically ill after. So you're going to want to have good medical documentation. If you think someone's chronically ill or disabled, you want to get them to a doctor to get opinion letters right after the client dies if they're if it's not already established because proximity and time can be very important absolutely before we move forward on powers of appointment i do want to address address a question uh, so someone asked if the estate if someone's estate says the assets go 50 percent to two minor children and ira benefits are left to the estate does that is that in the five-year rule territory or is that in you know the potential life expectancy up until 10 years after a minor's uh, majority and the answer is if it goes to an estate you're in five-year rule territory unfortunately um, there's a few private letter rulings out there that say if the spouse has control over the assets and if the spouse uh, is entitled to outright distribution of the ira he or she can then roll it over um, I wouldn't, I, I would feel more comfortable with a more proper rollover, but that is there as a potential tool. But by and large, if IRA assets go to an estate, you are going to be subject to the five-year rule. So powers of appointment. We talked earlier about this, uh, just to get into a little more nitty gritty on it. As I said, if I leave IRA assets to an accumulation trust for my friend Alan, our example, our running example here, and he has a power of appointment, so he can say who who he's going to leave assets to uh, upon his death or at any point in time. If he exercises or restricts it before September 30, then only the persons to whom it can be appointed in favor of, or to whom it was appointed in favor of, are considered to be beneficiaries of the trust. Here's the example. Alan takes that power of appointment and says, I'm going to leave, I'm going to appoint these assets to my, my daughter, Nicole. Nicole is considered to be a beneficiary as of the trust for required minimum distribution purposes. If the power of appointment says to Alan that he can appoint it to, um, you know, 
anyone who's a descendant of his great grandparent, uh, meaning that he can appoint it to his parents or his siblings, uh, he could restrict that. If he restricts the power of appointment to say no, it's only restricted to his descendants, then only Allen's descendants count for required minimum distribution purposes. This can be helpful, um, you know, if you have a power of appointment that maybe you know is very broad and you want to you want to reduce down the scope. Of, of potential persons who could inherit under the power of appointment. If Allen exercises that power of appointment after that magic September 30 day, then only the people who are added, so only the people to whom he appoints assets in favor of, and the takers in default. So if we say Allen can appoint the assets in favor of any charity or any of his descendants, he appoints it for Nicole, Nicole is a beneficiary, uh, and whoever would inherit Allen's assets or the IRA assets after Allen's death also are taken into account. That's if this is done after that magic September 30 day. But if Allen does not do anything with the power of appointment before that September 30 day uh, and doesn't exercise it until he exercises it, it's just the takers in default, meaning that it's just who would inherit upon his death if he did not exercise the power of appointment. It's a little confusing, and we've attempted to, to cut through it. Um, you know, we have an example from the proposed regs, but this chart here on slide 49 goes over uh, what the potential outcomes would be with reference to a power of appointment. Another aspect of modifying trusts after death is, of course, uh, We'll talk here in a second about you know trust reformations decanting. You know if that's done before September 30, the IRA the IRS will say all right well whatever you do as of September 30, that's what the beneficiaries are for for determination of required minimum distributions. Under prior law, you couldn't do much after after death without having uh, beneficiaries taken into account. So this change by the proposed regs has greatly broaden the scope of post-mortem planning that can occur. So as Alan said, don't rush into the broker's office to ma start making changes. Take a look at the big picture and see what can be done after death, if anything is necessary to get a more favorable required minimum distribution payout. Alan, any comments or anything to add? No, let's go ahead and do the next polling question. I thought you did a great job on that. Thank you. By the way, on the way to the polling question, I really like these slides. These were the first slides we made under the, the SECURE Act. So they show you kind of from best to, best to worst on a pyramid. So anyway, uh, and then Chris, during the polling question, if you want to look at the questions we've gotten, because we only sure have thing. about eight minutes here. Okay, under the SECURE Act, beginning for people who die on or after January 1st, 2020, the required, I'm sorry, people living, people today living, the required beginning date when you have to start taking money out of your IRA is now A, age 10, nope, B, age 60, nope, C, age 70 and a half, that's what it was, it's not anymore, and D, the correct answer, age 72. So those of you who are CPAs and are awake, go ahead and put in D, for 72, that's D as in dog. <laughs> if you have a dog, I hope they just bark back. <laughs> okay, so the majority of the people put in D, age 72, their dogs barked back. And Chris, what do you want to do for the next seven minutes? Uh, well, Alan, we could go over that chart briefly. I'm looking at the questions here, and I think we've covered a lot of them organically. Uh, you know, let's see here. And so, if a decedent, here's one question: If an IRA participant died in 2020 and was already required to take RMDs and did not take an RMD in 2020 before death, were the individual beneficiaries required to take the RMD in 2020? And the answer is yes, yes. Now, the year of death is for the the participant or IRA owner, uh, and it's the year after that commences the distribution schedules that we're talking about. You know, one 
thing that I've come across in practice, you know, I had a client who had a pretty substantial IRA and despite our recommendations, he left it to an estate, which then paid it to charity. So there really wasn't much of a, a bad income tax hit. I mean, there was, you know, you get a corresponding tax deduction for what goes to the charity. Um, he didn't take his 2020 distribution or not 2020, excuse me, his, his distribution in the year of death. Um, we didn't realize it because he died late in the year until the next year. But because his estate is able to elect a fiscal year, we essentially were allowed to, def to, to extend the tax year and take the RMD within that extended tax year to avoid that 50% excise tax. The distribution amount wasn't enormous, but it was certainly a nice little technique to use uh, if you have that situation. So we talk about the pyramid chart here. The top is the best. You know, we always want to be towards the top of the pyramid. And the outright to a surviving spouse is generally the most favorable. That is, as we talked about, uh, because of the rollovers, because of the more favorable distribution schedule that applies uniquely to spouses and not for um, not for other eligible designated beneficiaries. I apologize, it's gotten kind of ominous and dark here, but there's a big storm rolling in here down in, in uh, West Florida, West Central Florida. So forgive us for the for the, the lighting issue. Um, the second level is the the life expectancy rule. This is benefits for those eligible designated beneficiaries, the surviving spouse, the chronically ill or disabled beneficiary, uh, the minor child of the IRA owner, uh, or an individual no more than 10 years younger than the participant. And this applies if it goes outright in a conduit trust or an, an accumulation trust that's exclusively for uh, one of those classes. Now, I just made a slip up. I said minor child, which certainly get that treatment. However, we put the minor child uh, down a rung here because when the minor child hits age 21, you have to start taking distributions out over the 10 year rule. And if I died after age 72, then not only does that mean all benefits have to come out to the to the trust or come out of the IRA when the minor hits age 31, but also years one through nine, there's that annual recurring distribution that needs to occur. So that's why the miners, we don't think that they're up to snuff to be on level two. The miners will be here on level three. Level four is our is our 10 year rule that applies um, for IRA distributions that are left to a conduit trust uh, for a non-eligible designated beneficiary, uh, outright to a non-eligible designated beneficiary, or to even an accumulation trust that is not exclusively for eligible designated beneficiaries. And we talked about that 10-year rule and, and what it entails, but that's level four. And then the dreaded five-year rule uh, here on level five. I will make note of a little exception to the five-year rule, and that is something that was formerly known as the at least as rapidly rule. Here, here's how it works. I die after age 72. Uh, I'm taking distributions according to my life expectancy under the requirement of distribution tables. I die, I leave the benefits to an older beneficiary, for example. Well, that beneficiary can choose my life expectancy because it's more favorable. The way it used to work is distributions must have had to come out at least as rapidly as they were under the participant's lifetime. So if I leave assets to a corporation or to a charity, for example, IRA assets, that is, you can use my life expectancy rather than the five-year rule, um, you know, if I was after my required beginning date. So that's a little wrinkle that applies in certain situations. And just moving through here, more charts to show you all. I'm not going to spend time in our remaining uh, two minutes together to go over all these. Uh, and, you know, just to let you know that they're here, the teapot trust that I mentioned earlier, there's some numerical examples, which I know are, can be very helpful in illustrating this. And then finally, we have some information at the end about leaving assets to charity, uh, IRA assets, that is, you know, the stretch crut, there are slides about this. There's also slides that cover how to structure charitable devices. Generally, it's best to leave the IRA directly to charity, although you could leave it to a trust that pays to charity. Um, but if you do so, maybe not make it a pecuniary device. Instead, do it so it's a fractional, so the charity gets a percentage, um, or just skip that altogether and just leave it directly to charity if possible.
Alan, I think we have about a minute and change left. Any Anything further you want me to cover? Um, I just think, you know, back to the basics, let's just make sure that we know who the beneficiary designation is payable to. Because a lot of times we meet with the client and we say, well, you need to make the beneficiary designation your spouse, alternate your revocable trust. That way, if your spouse disclaims it or dies before you, then it goes into separate accumulation trust for the children. And the client goes, right, I'll do that right away. And then they even send you an email that says, I did that. And then they die and it turns out they didn't do that. Somehow they got it wrong. Or for some reason, clients do it right and then they switch brokers. And the new broker doesn't ask how it should be done. So then suddenly it's payable directly to these children who have not reached age 31 and maturity wise will never reach age 31. So that, that type of uh, problem happens way too often. Chris, maybe in one minute, you can also explain that sometimes the brokerage houses won't do what you ask them to do. Your client dies and it's supposed to go into a trust and divide three different ways. And you say to the brokerage house, okay, we need this to happen. And the brokerage house says, no, we don't do it that way. So then you have to switch brokerage houses, transfer everything to the new broker. And once you find the broker willing to do it. That's yeah, it, 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 I can't understand the importance of the beneficiary designation and, and working with the brokers. Get them involved when you do the beneficiary designations. Let them know what the client wants to do. Let them know uh, that you're able to help. A lot of times, Alan, what we'll do is we have a form that we use for beneficiary designation. And just a couple of weeks ago, we came up with this really nice estate plan for a gentleman with a pretty substantial IRA. We use Morgan Stanley's form. And on it, we said, for the beneficiary, see Exhibit A. And the Exhibit A was reviewed and approved by the broker uh, and the client, of course, signed by the client. And that allowed for uh, coordination. So hopefully, you know, whenever the client passes away, we're able to seamlessly assure that the IRA is payable as he intended without a lot of red tape or a lot of uh, surprises that we didn't account for uh, when we came up with the estate plan. All right, Chris. Well, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing the Notre Dame two-hour presentation. I hope a lot of our attendees sign up for the Notre Dame Institute. We'll be sending you information about it. And uh, thanks again, Chris. Have a great afternoon with your children. Oh, thank you, guys. Have a great day. All right. Super. Well, as I said in the beginning, I have a special interview here with Jackson Schembecker. And uh, Jackson is a 19-year-old success story, and he's tech savvy, so he was able to sign right on here. And uh, Jackson, I just want to, you know, start right in. Uh, you and I have spoken before for about four minutes. Yeah. I met your mother for the first time on the phone Thursday, and we got to talking about high schools and high school success and. I'm giving a talk next Tuesday at Kieran Patel High School on getting ready for your career. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and and uh, how you got here. Yeah, so it's been a it's been an interesting journey. It's been a five year process now. I started everything just about when I was 14, and some of the initial stages happened earlier, but really the bulk of it came when I was 14. I was a freshman in high school, and it was really interesting. I was in a class where all ages were in that class. So it was a orchestra class, a bunch of nerds playing instruments, right? Um, and I was a freshman and one of the seniors in there was talking about cryptocurrency. It was one of those classic stories where week one of high school, I got involved, I, I wanted to reach out to people. And this kid's talking about a subset of, of what is finance, basically. And he was talking about a coin that he really liked and he did very well up front, money wise, right? Just quantifying it. And I thought it was really interesting. And I decided to listen to him and kind of dive in. And so I, I spent 100 plus hours over that first and second semester. It was 2017 to put a timeline to it, which if you know anything about cryptocurrency, the quarter four of 2017 was the first real big public boom. That was the first time Bitcoin hit just under 20,000. It started to go mainstream in the press and a lot of attention was around it. So the timing was really good. But what what made it fruitful for me is that I stuck with it, right? I didn't just quit after the 2017 when, when the markets crashed in 18. I, I really, I put in those hundred plus hours of, of learning the actual skill, 
what is it, how do I trade it, how do I make accounts, how do I protect my assets when I have it, doing all those things and kind of running through kind of everything that I needed to do, it helped and it paid off a lot of dividends in the future, right? 2018, I got killed. Um, in 2017, I made a, a nice little chunk of change, right? I, I look at it almost as a lump sum now. And 2018, I lost roughly 70 to 80% of it. So it was, a, it was a wild ride. And me in the meantime, right, I am then a, a freshman still in high school going into my sophomore year, right? I've got no expertise, no experience compared to all these older people that are telling me crypto is just for the short term. You should get into stocks if you want to do anything in the finance realm, right? All these people that are saying that crypto is just, just a passing thing. It's just a fad, right? And the key there was that I had done all the research on the front end. I had put in the time where I could explain Bitcoin and I knew why I liked it and I knew why I was investing in it. And that's something that I tell people all the time is that what you're investing in, the, the actual asset itself is not that important. The important thing is that you are competent, you understand the research that you did, you understand why you got into it. And if you believe that, right, I mean, that, that's kind of technical, the technicalities of fundamental analysis in the, in the beginning, right? If you are liking something and you're deciding to invest in it, there's got to be a reason for that. And, and if you go with the kind of logic that that's competent research and that it is good, then the investment's sound. And so I, I stuck with these investments and I was doubling down when the markets were going down in 2018. And it ended up paying off very, very well in 2019, 20 and 21. Right. And now here we are in 2022. Um, I did very, very well uh, on, the, on the quantity side, did, did pretty well kind of in, in respect to net worth in relation to age. Right. Um, wanted to give back. So I, I, I donated a, a large amount to my high school, which is a, a private uh, school here. And, and they were really the launching point for me. They, I mean, that the 18 year old that introduced me when I was 14, he helped me out tremendously. And then from there, when a lot of this went public and we had some of the people that were gonna get it out into the press, right? And I got on radio shows, in, in, on TV, bunch of magazines, bunch of different things, including a bunch of national news, that was, I mean, it wasn't just me, right? It was a team of people helping me because they thought it was a good story, right? And then last two things, I mean, I wrote a book in 2021. I released, I released at the beginning of 2022. That was great. Um, it, it really kind of pushed forward the accolade, right? That like this kid being me actually knew a little bit of, of what he was doing, right? And then the last thing was now, uh, I kind of wanted to take this a bit further, right? I mean, I have these individual accounts, which are great. They've got a lot of zeros on it but that's still just me. I wanted to make something bigger. And so now I'm launching my own firm. Uh, it'll be a hedge fund and it's launching actually October 1. So 20, 21 days out and we'll be live. Wow. So, so I guess what caused you as a 14 year old to be a little bit different than your peer group? Cause your peer group was playing in the band and going out for lunch and playing games. What caused you to be different? So it's a couple things. Um, number one, I, I've always been a little bit geared towards like doing extra things, right? And I, I, I said at the very beginning that technically this did start a little beforehand, but the, the launch point was when I was 14. So I'm gonna give you a very basic example because I think it's important, right? This never actually yielded anything, but it wasn't an important step, right? Back when I was in middle school, let's say that now I'm 10 or 11 years old, right? I was always entrepreneurial in spirit and not in the sense of like Gary V of trying to hustle and just get there of actually trying to be kind of business oriented and being productive in what you're doing. And I was, again, like I was a nerd, right? I think a lot of people in this finance space are nerds and that's fine, right? And so I was I, I was into Rubik's Cubes, right? Just a, a, think of it a middle school hobby, right? But what I did was I noticed that because I was into it, some other people got into it. And so I, I began looking at it from a business standpoint and started selling Rubik's Cubes all across campus. And it's the basic sale that kind of got me into that, right? And again, these are very, very small numbers, right? But I was wholesaling them from China at $3 a piece and selling them on campus for $20 a piece. And I mean, that margin's great. Obviously that's not really a scalable big business, right? But that was kind of the foundation, right? And so that got into then, all right, I, I passed that trend and then I got into sneakers and then I passed that trend and then I got into crypto, right? So it was always a little bit in me and that I, I liked business. I liked the art of selling. I liked the art of giving value, right? Because I'm a firm believer that it's not just what you sell, it's that it only sells if you have value, right? So if you create a trend and then people buy into that trend, you're creating value, right? Similarly, if you sell a house, there's intrinsic value in that. Someone has to live there, right? So that was kind of one, always being a little bit on the side of wanting to be productive in that sense. 
but I will push back a little bit and say that even though like I'm, I'm still I'm still a kid I'm just 19 right and I do think that balance is a little bit important and I do preach specialization all the time but I think that I mean I did still play some video games freshman year I did still play sports I mean I still play sports today right so I still think that being a well-rounded individual is very important, but I do think spending a lot of time and being hyper-productive with that time, and you can gauge that on an individual basis, right? If, if you know as an individual, if you spend eight hours on something, were those eight hours really a productive, solid eight hours? And I would argue in most cases, that eight hours can be turned into four hours and be just as productive if you were more productive with your time, right? So that's kind of the second thing. I think that, that being a well-rounded individual is important, but you have to be very, very particular about what you specialize in and what you're spending your time on. Tell, did you read some books? Did you oh, watch yes, yes. videos or what, what pointed you the right way at age 13 and 14? Absolutely, yeah. So a big thing was learning from others, no question. So in this crypto game, so I never really had like, like a lot of people get a little boost from their parents or an uncle or someone in the knowledge base, right? And I had that boost, but not with a familial person, right? It was exactly what you said. It was reading books, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos. And I really want to put this into perspective. I mean, you're in high school, right? So I would get up at 6 to 7 a.m. The day starts at 8 a.m. I'm then booked from 8 a.m. to 3.30 in classes. I played sports. So 4 to like 6, 4 to 6.30 was sports. And then during the in-season, that's way longer for baseball. But during the fall, that's that's 6.37. So let's say I'm done with the day at like 7, 7.38, somewhere in there. That 8 o'clock to like kind of midnight is when the time was to get into it. And so, but that's exactly what I did. And I was very, very, again, I was very deliberate with what I was doing. So I get home at that 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, right? I now have three, four hours to dive into what I wanted to specialize into. And again, there was no guarantee that that was going to be successful, right? I always looked at it as the sense that, hey, if I lose my little sum of money that I'm starting with, that's just a lesson. And I'm going to be one of the smartest kids in high school when it comes to cryptocurrency. And if I lose all my money, that's okay, because at least I learned something along the way, right? And I went in with that mindset, and it, it ended up paying off for sure. But I had to spend, and it's very important, I had to spend those two plus hours every single day reading books listening to podcasts of people that are, that are smarter than me, just watching YouTube videos, right? Things like that. Now, granted that YouTube, there were people that were just trying to pump and dump coins and being scammers, right? So you had to learn how to filter things in and out of what is really important, who's teaching actual technicals, and what's fundamentally important about a certain project versus I just want your money, right? And that was very important of kind of deliberating and deciding what's good news and what's bad news. And I think that's an important skill for everyone, right? Because that you can extrapolate that to the Wall Street Journal. I mean, more, some articles are just going to be more important than others, right? And while everything should be looked at, not everything can be internalized. And I think building that skill over a long time frame and kind of learning how to filter in and out, but certainly taking in a lot of information, it, it served to be very, very important. Wow. So so let's talk, let, let's go back more to this high school career. because I'm, yeah. I'm speaking to high schoolers on Tuesday. So you managed to, I assume, do decent in school. Yeah, yeah, I did well. <laughs> you didn't tell me when you did your homework. What time did you do your homework? Time, man, I, I think so. Time management's a huge thing, no question. And a lot of people talk to me about, I don't have time. And I think it's a terrible, terrible excuse. I think it's a negative mindset. I think everyone has time. It's, it's not even a question. And I'm speaking as someone who got straight A's in high school, played sports to a level where I'm a collegiate athlete now. I, I ran a successful individual portfolio. So I did it. And that's not trying to come off in an arrogant sense, but in a sense that if I can do it, I really think that you can do it. And I think that you can do it to a better degree because I'm only a standard of, of someone, right? Who's saying that I'm the best? I'm not saying that, right? So anyone can do it. And you have to just be very deliberate. What I, what I think is, number one, have a calendar, right? Have a schedule. I mean, I guarantee most people on this call do but you have to follow through with what's on that schedule. And I tell this to people that are young, right? I don't need to tell this to you, Alan, obviously you have that down, right? But young people a lot, right? They go into autopilot. And I've found this a lot with my peers because I mean, my peer group is a young group. A lot of people, okay, they're in high school, right? That means they wake up, they go to school and their only two responsibilities on the day for the most part, right? Are to go to their sport or club after school, right? And then to just, do the bare minimum right for the next day 
So if they have a test the next day, they can study. And again, that's not even mandatory. You don't have to study, right? I mean, I would suggest that it's probably a good idea, but you don't have to. And because the kind of responsibilities are so low as a young person, it ends up being that there's no schedule. If you wanna sleep in on a weekend and do absolutely nothing, you can, right? No one's gonna stop you. I mean, some parents will, but it, it, it's up to you. It's individual responsibility. So I think that garnering individual responsibility over time at a rapid pace becomes very, very important. And what I mean by that is have a schedule, put things on it, and then execute what's on it. It's very simple, right? When we set up this call for the tech demo yesterday, myself and your assistant were both there and both on time, right? I think a lot of young people nowadays aren't there, aren't on time, or don't set it up. And those are three things that you have to follow through, and they're very, very basic. But when you're talking to a young audience, you kind of have to preach it in a concrete manner so that they understand. Because people don't necessarily learn just intrinsically, right? You have to kind of be taught by someone, some way or another. Right. And then you, you're you also a piano player and a, did I see a violinist? Yes. Yeah. So I played music all through my life. I started piano when I was five. I started violin in middle school, probably what eight or nine. Um, and yeah, I played it all the way through. So I, I have about 15, let's see how many years, 14 years of piano experience. And then violin, I, I played all the way through university. I was in the orchestra last year on campus. Super. Now tell me about the selection of the University of Tampa. Yes, yeah, so certainly. So I was always bred to go Ivy League, right? I was always like, do, my mom would always tell me, do your best, right? And she's a very high achieving person herself. And she, it wasn't even like pressure, right? She was never one of those Indian parents that like told you you have to get straight A's. It was just that that was kind of expected. And it's not that anything bad would happen if you didn't. It's just that that's what happened, right? Like, why would you get a B if you have the potential to get an A, right? Very simple. And again, it, it nothing bad happens that's the thing i think it's very again individual responsibility because having a 3.8 gpa versus a 4.0 and you get into weighted distributions let's say a 4.2 or a 4.4 right there's technically not a big difference provided that you're not going to those ultra selective colleges right but it was just always that kind of high performance is expected so i performed well that's great right and so i was always bred to kind of go into my, my top pick was columbia right at, at, at first actually interestingly enough I always wanted to go to NYU. I thought the Stern School of Business there was fantastic, always wanted to go there. Um, and what happened was the, the selection process, through this whole high school career, I'm playing baseball at a competitive level. And so I wanted to play in college, hands down. I really, really wanted to play. And so I went to this academic showcase for baseball, and I spoke with the NYU coach, and he gave me an offer. And that was an amazing, amazing day, right? I mean, this was my dream college forever, and I just got an offer to play baseball there, which means you don't really have to do the ultra selective game of college admissions. You just get to backdoor in as a athlete, right? Which was amazing. Um, and regardless, I mean, I mean, you know the NY, NYU acceptance, right? I think it's 4% right now, it's brutal, right? And that's that's what it is today. And so I finally got that and it was, it was an achievement. It was a significant achievement in the sense that I could go in New York City to the school I wanted to go. And right when I got that offer, I immediately thought what's better than NYU? Columbia. And so I, I wanted to get into Columbia, and then I, I, I expanded to all Ivies. I, I X'd out some of them, but I wanted to go either Columbia, Yale, uh, Princeton for sure. Obviously, they have a phenomenal business program. So I was always going to go Northeast. And what happened was senior year, the crypto stuff started to take off. Like I said, bunch of national recognition, bunch of things happening very quickly at a, I would say, large scale in Tampa. And what happened was all of it's happening, all of it's happening. It's all in Tampa. And the second I get on that plane and go to New York and live there and, and start a college kind of experience there, a lot of the Tampa connections not necessarily die, but certainly get put on the back burner. And I had to really think about it. And then, well, I didn't really want to go to Florida State. I mean, that's a, it's a, and nothing wrong with Florida State. It's a great state school. I have plenty of friends there, of course. And I, I applied to UF. I mean, I didn't really want to go to UF. Um, but what happened was baseball came along, right? And so I looked at University of Tampa and I went to a showcase previously and the coach finally gave me an offer. And this was my senior year of fall. And he gave me that offer for baseball and it came down to this, the kind of basic decision, do I wanna to go to the Northeast? And I, I can play baseball at a high level there. It's an amazing school and let most of the business connections really just sit or do I wanna stay in Tampa, 
still play baseball, still go to a, a good school. Granted, University of Tampa is not on the same level as those Ivy Leagues. I completely understand that, right? But the business gets to flourish. That's the thing. I I mean, numerous networking events, all the local firms. I know, I would say for my age, I have a lot of great contacts in my phone that would not be there if I wasn't local. And that that rapid expansion has really paid off. And that was the basic decision. It was the fact that baseball's constant. I can play baseball at either location. Either school's going to get me a degree, right? It's not the biggest difference. Of course, an Ivy League degree is going to be better. But where can I continue to do what I'm doing now at a high, high level? That's the thing, because I can still be on my laptop, trade currencies, do whatever I want anywhere across the country, right? But it's the fact that networking and, and meeting people and being able to take advantage and give to those business connections, it, it's just going to happen at a better level here in Tampa. And that's what the decision came down to. Yeah, sounds like a good one. You know, I, I think I'd rather be in the top 5% at University of Tampa than average at Yale. Yeah, that, that, that's another good point. Absolutely. I, I did kind of look at it, right? And I mean, yes, high IQ, great, somewhat smart. That's awesome. But when you get put into that very, very competitive landscape, it's difficult. I mean, it's difficult for anyone. It's It's not just easy straight A's without barely doing anything, right? It's that all those people, I mean, the average is still a C up there, right? So, I mean, these these people that have been defined by their intelligence their whole life, you get put into that pond of extremely, extremely difficult tasks. And it does help that, yes, right? I mean, I mean, UT is on paper very easy for me, right? But it's because I've been able to perform at this level and do different things. And now I get to take advantage of the opportunities here. So, so a lot of us on the call are parents or grandparents. And, you know, you're obviously very observant, goal oriented, and had a lot of friends in high school during a tough time during the COVID years. You know, when you go to raise your children, based on what you saw going on with your peer group and, and going on with you, you know, what were the big differences on how you raise a child or how you have a family or how, or uh, how the Indian community in Tampa is different than the American community in Tampa? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's huge. And again, I, I can't say that I'm an expert on this. I don't have kids, right? But my mom did a phenomenal job to the point where I have two brothers and they're also extremely successful, right? They're very good at everything that they do. Um, I think one big thing is expectation, right? And it's not that there should be punishments, right? There's like, my mom never really punished me, right? Like there's no, if you don't do this, this happens, right? Consequences are, are more of like, why did you do this wrong? How can we fix that next time, right? I mean, it's a, you spill the milk on the table, right? You shouldn't like hit the kid in my opinion. You should just say, don't spill the milk next time. And as long as it doesn't become a repetitive thing, that's the problem solved, that's it. Oh, hold on, gotta hit this light. Um, so I think it's a, it, it's very, expectations huge, right? And my mom did do a couple things that I find very interesting, right? Okay, let's say we're in, we're going skiing, right? This is, this is a hypothetical scenario, right? But let's say we're going skiing. When we're, when we were very young, what she would have us do is she'd have us write about the skiing experience, right? And so you're building just certain skills while having the basic childhood thing of you're going skiing at a young age, right? You go on this vacation write about the vacation and, and kind of try and write at a high level, right? And the point is that when you're in, when you're six, when you're seven, obviously the writing level is gonna be low, but if you do that every single vacation, by the time you're nine, 10, you're just gonna, you're, I mean, simply you're gonna be in relation, your, your writing skills are probably gonna be better than those of your peers who didn't do that amount of writing, right? It's the same thing, I mean, you, let's say, all the kids that go through calculus in high school and they know calculus, I would say that five years out, if they don't use calculus, they don't know calculus, right? So you, you have to just be using what you can, right? And so as parents, you need to be putting your kids in situations where they could be doing the most and not to burn them out, but in the sense of, I wouldn't know how to play piano if my mom didn't put me in play piano, right? I wouldn't know how to play violin if I didn't sign up for the violin course in, in middle school, right? I wouldn't know cryptocurrency if I just wrote off the entire subject when that kid introduced it to me, right? So you need to put yourself in uncomfortable situations that can allow yourself to grow. That's the whole point of youth, in my opinion, right? It's just growing until you reach that adulthood level where you're pretty constant. Um, and so I, I think that that's a very easy thing to do. I really do. I don't think it's it's very difficult, right? 
you sign up for X and you get Y. It, it's it's a it's it's pretty much a relationship, right? You you do, you put the input to get the output, and I don't think it's that hard. I just think that you have to consistently put yourself in that space. Yeah. What is the drug and alcohol risk to high schoolers and first year college students? I I'm so okay. I the thing is I am not super into it, right? So I, but obviously I've seen a lot. Um, like I never did drugs or alcohol in high school. Uh, like I don't, I want to, I, I say this carefully because I don't think that if you drink and go to a party once that you're going to not be as productive as if you didn't go to the party, right? What I would say though, is that you need to, you need to be, you have to go in with intent, right? If you're 14, you should not be drinking, right? If you're 16, you still probably shouldn't be drinking. You know, if you're 17 or 18 and you're going into college and you want to go to a party, I would say, okay, fine. But I think that you have to be balanced with it. And that's the biggest thing. You should not be going to a party three days in a row, right? Like, third, and uh, believe me, I know plenty of kids who do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and they go all weekend. If you want to go that one Saturday, fine, but then don't really go again until the next Saturday. And, and you're going to have the same relationships. I'm telling you, if, if the argument is that I'm going to have a better relationship if I go to all three of these parties, I'm going to say that that relationship with that person is not the relationship you want to have. Because that's the person that's going to be doing the drugs and going to the constant parties versus being productive and successful. And I say that loosely because there are plenty of examples, especially as we're getting into this culture of constant partying and being successful while, do, while doing it. And I think it's possible. I mean, I'm not going to say that I haven't gone to a party. Like, right? Like, it's a lot of fun. Go do it. It's a great experience. But you have to limit it. And I think you can take that in going into everything, right? If you attack all of that with the sense that I'm going to do it, I'm going to have a great time doing it but I'm going to limit it. I don't think it's as bad as it seems, but I think you've got to be very, very careful with it. And the problem is that you do need a little bit of kind of, I'm not going to say need, but probably need uh, parental like guidance in that area. Right. I mean, these kids, and I see it all the time. I do, right. These kids are going out and they're, they're testing their limits and they don't know what's going on. Right. And they're going, especially these first year college students, believe me, I, I've watched kids who I know are smart, like who I know can do it. And I've watched them get GPAs below 2.5, below 3.0, below. And these are kids that are 4.0s in high school, right? But it's that the alcohol and the party just consumed them, right? And it's very easy. It's a very slippery slope because your parents aren't there. You have, I mean, you have to know what you're doing, right? No one's going to tell you no. If you want to just go out, go to sleep at 5 a.m., skip your class, no one's going to tell you no, right? It's up to you. Um, so I think you need a little bit of guidance, but at some point, the individual and the individual is going to be 15 through, or we can start younger, right? 13 through 20, right? They need to start taking control and kind of doing it themselves. And the only way that that can be productive is when the parents lay the proper like footing, right? If, if, if the parents show the proper landscape and they have to set a good example too. I mean, like personally, my mom didn't drink and I'm not saying don't drink, right? But I'm saying because it was always that she always had her head on straight and she was she was a single mom who has done phenomenal right um i think showing it in that lens showing a good example it, it really does do a lot right so what are some of your goals i know you know i know the crypto and the hedge fund is going to be amazing um are you looking to go pro with the baseball are you what do you want to be doing in 10 years yeah, there's certainly a lot of a lot of goals floating around right now. I mean, on the quantitative side, I, I definitely want to add another zero onto the net worth. I'm I'm very close, right? My long-term goal is I want to hit 100 million before 30. Um, I, I think I can do it. Like I'm on I'm on pace and everything. I know it sounds ridiculous and everything, but you got to try, right? Um, so that's my big quantitative goal on the the 10 year time frame. Baseball, I want to take it as far as I can. I'm a collegiate athlete right now. Uh, the school I'm at, University of Tampa, they have an 18% draft rate. So if you stay healthy and you stay in the program, you've got just oh. under a one in five chance to go. So I like those odds. I mean, it's pretty good. So I'm doing my best to stay healthy. Obviously, I, I spend a immense, immense amount of time on baseball to, to do that. Uh, it's about, I'm going to say, minimum two hours a day between working out and throwing, right? Um, so that's my, my baseball goal. Uh, I, I still play my music. The college mm -hmm. courses, I mean... I have a lot of stuff going on in the in the background, so I don't put an immense amount of effort into the college courses, but of course I still want to have a good GPA. I, I still, of course I do great in my classes. I'm not like not doing homework and not 
showing up to exams and stuff. Um, but I kind of coached through that a little bit. Um, but a lot of it is on the finance spectrum. Uh, like material wise, I want to get, like I have a nice car. I want to get a nicer car, right? I have a decent portfolio. I want to double it or triple it in less than two or three years, right? Um, and so I, I, I think all those are doable with what I'm doing. Uh, this hedge fund we're launching with an initial five to 10 million. I want to scale that to 25 million by summer 2023. I think we can do it, especially with the way we're doing right now, if we can do, and again, I can't get into too, too much of the details, but if we can do 20 to 30% before year end, the way the market's moving right now, we should be able to do that. There's no reason we can't do a second round and raise 10 million because people are going to see and hear the story. 19 year old running a hedge fund does this percentage on a big scale and has a five year tracker to go five year track record to go with it. So those are some of my goals there. I've got, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of different things that I'm, I'm trying to do and, and get done. Um, but it's, it's really just trying to expand the success, do well athletically. And I mean, try and have a good time in college while doing all that. So my, my last question for you is tell me about the process of writing a book. The crypto kid yeah, yeah. and what, it's, what it's, you think you know about writing a book absolutely and see so i wrote mine it was a, it was a nine month process for me we released in january i started getting going about march april 2021 you have to first have a general idea right and what i found because i talked to a lot of other authors i talked to publishers that worked with a lot of authors and what you find is you have to really break down what you want to convey so you want to start with a general message and then you want to break that message into, let's say, four points. And then those four points, you got to break into, let's say, 10 chapters or 20 chapters, whatever you're going to do. And it's a lot, a lot of work because you're going to get that initial framework down. And that framework is going to take you less than a week, right? But then you're going to open a Word document and you're going to have to just write. And there's no one telling you what to write because you're writing it. There's no one guiding you because people that guide you just edit it on the back end. No one can really tell you what you want to say, right? So you, you have to have a framework, you have to really dive into it. And it is a grueling process. I will say that I thought about quitting probably two or three times seriously during the writing process because I mean, it's brutal. And everyone has their other responsibilities. For me at the time, it was high school. It was getting all that done. It was, it was managing my current accounts. For you, maybe it's being the professor here and then doing these different ventures, having this webinar, doing all these things, right? For all the people, the attendants listening, maybe it's the nine to five job, maybe it's not a nine to five job, maybe it's a business, and then you have to take care of your kids. There's all just all these responsibilities that add up. And then at the end of the day, you have to sit down and stare at a blank Word document. And there's no one telling you that you have to do it, right? If you're at work, maybe your boss is telling you to get it in. If you're at school, maybe your teacher is saying you have a deadline on this. So no one's telling you that you have to do it. And you just have to write and let it flow. And you want to try and write to a high degree such that you're getting an important message across. And so it becomes very, very difficult. But I would say number one is having having a message, right? And that message needs to be very strong. And then you want to divide that message up into multiple points of how can you do what you want to do, right? And it, kind of attack it like a research paper, right? Kind of. I, I say that lightly because it's just a, a world of a difference. Because writing a 10-page paper, I mean, we've all had those nights where we write a 10 pages in, in a day, right? And it's like you're just absolutely fried at the end of it, but you get it done. And then you say, all right, instead of 10 pages, let me do 100 pages, or let me do just 50 pages, let me do 500 pages. And it's a lot of pages, right? I mean, a lot of people on here have done dissertations and have their PhD and stuff, right? And that's great. So you guys know how to write at a high level for a significant amount of pages. But I, I do think a book's a whole nother thing. It's a whole nother animal to attack. It's uh, certainly a lot to do, but it is rewarding, right? And you're gonna, at the end of it all, you're gonna have negative feedback, you're gonna have positive feedback, but it's all worth it, in my opinion when you have those couple people reach out and say, I've learned so much and I've done X, Y, and Z as a result. And I've had both kids my age and adults that have kids of them, their own my age. And I've had plenty of positive feedback, of course, negative feedback as well, but I think it's a double-edged sword. People are always gonna hate just as much as they like. And that's why it's important to take, to not worry about the negative feedback. Likewise, you can't let the positive feedback inflate your ego, right? So you have to kind of compromise there. But I've had a ton of positive feedback that says, like, I used to have only $10,000 to my name or whatever, right? Just, And now they're at 50 and they're starting a business, right? And they're into a certain subset of whatever, right? It doesn't have to be cryptocurrency. Some of the lessons in that book are just how to kind of build success starting with nothing, right? Because that was a little bit of my story, right? I mean, and I, I 
want to stress there that you can use the tools that you have. And everyone's tools are going to be different, right? Some people are going to have parents that have PhDs that are very well versed in a lot of different subjects, right? Huge advantage. Some people are going to have rich parents. Some people are not, right? If, it, if you have money to start, that's a great advantage. Take advantage of it. And I don't think it's a bad thing. If you have rich parents, whatever, it is what it is, right? You should use what you have access to. And if you have none of that, maybe you have to go to the public library and start there, right? There's always a resource available. You just have to take advantage of it, right? And so, I mean, circling back to that book, I mean, I'm sure there are books written on how to write a book. There's, it's, it's, a, it's a long drawn out process, it really is. I think the biggest thing is consistency. There were times where I hadn't thought about it for a week straight, right? And if you go seven days without opening the Word documents and without editing and without putting thought into it, you can drift away very, very quickly. And you can, you can extrapolate that logic to kind of any topic, but I, I think that you have to just stay consistent. If you're writing just 100 words a day, you're gonna have a lot of words in a year, right? So you gotta you gotta really just be consistent with it and, and say that, let me sit down for this amount of time every day or every other day or once a week, whatever your time frame is. But if you, I mean, my time frame, I was wanting to get it done as fast as possible because I wanted everything to launch while there was still momentum, right? Like, so it, it, I, had it, I had to go time sensitive. I had to go hybrid publishing because if I wanted to go traditional publishing, I would have had to go two to four years out because you have to work with the traditional public company publishing companies and that's a two to four four year process so i had to go hybrid publishing so there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through but i think the biggest thing is just being consistent and again that's a that's a very important thing obviously for anything but especially when writing a book if you stay consistent with it you will get it finished that that's the bottom line you have to stay consistent okay so let me ask you when i when i took the dale carnegie course they said always end a presentation with a call to action to ask your audience to do something so to the extent that my audience is going to be 15, 16 year old high school students, what is your call to action for them? Yeah, I think I think it's setting a goal on a short time frame. I I personally think less than six months. And then after that, you want to set a longer time frame goal. And they can both be together. So here's an example because I play baseball. My short term goal is I want to throw 92 miles an hour. My long-term goal is I want to throw 94 miles an hour and consistently throw 91 miles an hour, right? Very, very simple example, but you want to have a short-term goal with a long-term goal to back it up because you want to have a time frame of, of something to do, right? And then you want to do an action item a week towards that goal. And I think that's a very good time frame because if you're doing something every week, no matter what, right? Because that gives you a lot of room to screw up, right? If you go crazy on the weekend and you're not thinking about business or school or whatever, and then you get tied up Monday through Thursday, but if you just put an hour in on Friday, then you just accomplish that task, right? So you have to set an action item garnered towards the six month goal and make sure you complete it on at least a weekly basis. Very, very wow. important. That's fantastic. That's, That's perfect. Thank you. All right, well, Jackson, we, we, I'm getting a lot of good feedback from the uh, participants here. Really appreciate you joining us. I hope you'll come back just about any Saturday at noon to talk talk about maybe the specifics of crypto so you can teach all of us reptiles how that works. Just let us know. And, and what is your email address? My email address is jrshembakar at icloud.com. So okay. jr, last name, icloud.com. Okay, and if anybody wants to contact you, they can email me at agasman at gasmanpa.com and I'll forward it. Thanks again. Hey, hats off to your mother. What a great job she did. And what a, what a great person you are to even recognize it. So 100%. Thank you so much for having me on, Alan. Have a great weekend. Take care.